Hello and welcome. I'm Bruce. This is Speed and Color. On today's episode, Harrison and I take a look at my latest build and go over it in a fair amount of detail. There's some cool things on this bike that I thought I'd share with you. We also wanted to find a new format for, for looking at builds and for talking to builders. So I hope you'll give us some feedback on this. We think the format is good, but I'd like to know from you, what do you think of it? What would you like to see different? What works in what we did? So join us, sit down for a bit, take a look at the bike with us and enjoy. Welcome to Speed and Color. We're back again. Uh, today's episode, we're, we're going to talk about my latest build. Um, something that, uh, that we wanted to do. I think at this point, you've probably already seen Max bike. Uh, we did that one first. And I will just address the absence of Mac right now. Um, so, you know, it, this digital media thing, social media, all of it. I'm going to tell you, it is time consuming. It's a huge commitment, um, taking time to film and, and to edit and to do all of this stuff. It really is a big time commitment. Mac really wanted to do this. You know, we got some of it in. Uh, he has started a, a new career path. That's taking a lot of his time. And unfortunately, it's just really tough for him to fit stuff in right now. So Mac and I are cool. There's no issues or anything. Uh, you're probably going to see Mac back. Uh, that's fun to say. Um, you're probably going to see Mac back, but on a, on a limited appearance for now. Uh, so I went to work and thought, well, I got to have a, a new character uh, on screen with me. And uh, I found this guy. So Harrison is going to be with us. Uh, he's going to be working behind the, the cameras and mics, but in front of them as well. We're going to do a bunch of stuff together. Oh, yeah. Harrison, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah. So uh, Harrison rides. He's a character. We're going to get into all of that. I think we're probably going to have to do another episode where... Uh, where we talk to, to Harrison and learn yeah, some stuff. We got, we got some ideas, but we're not gonna, not gonna tell you about that right now. can't get into those, yeah. No. So, uh, here we go. Let's talk about Bruce's Sportster. Um, I, will, I will just say that if you watch the, I forget if it's in the introduction or if it's the Get to Know Bruce episode, you would know a little bit about this bike already that Karen bought this bike for me. Yeah. Uh, it was a surprise. I had seen it. I fell in love with the bike. She, uh, she bought it for me, which was absolutely crazy. Uh, it's been down to Port Dover to Friday the 13th with us. Uh, it's been around a little bit. And when just before the pandemic, not knowing the pandemic was going to happen, uh, just before the pandemic, I decided to refine it to do it my way to put my fingerprint on it um so i did did a bunch of stuff that uh that kept a lot of the original bike most of the original bike but just kind of tweaked it and and made it mine yeah i've seen that it was it wasn't that around like 2019 you were doing that i started in 2019 and uh i finished it oh boy February of this year of 2023. Nice. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and of course that tells everybody that we're filming this in 2023. 2023. Which, so I shouldn't have said that, but it's okay. It's yeah. a spoiler alert for <laughs> 2023. Wow. Um, yeah. So it it was a while getting done, uh, but again, uh, similar to our friend Kurt, who who builds. Yeah. I try and do everything myself, uh, and in this case, I built the motor, I did the paint, I did all the body work, I did the frame, um, uh, fabrication, uh, I did as much as I could possibly do on my own, and there's a couple little exceptions. 
and I'll talk about those and tell you about those when we get to them. But uh, that's the background. So I'm going to kick it over to Harrison to, to get me rolling. Start us off. Yeah, well, we got to start from the front of the bike for sure. So let's talk about like your fork setup, what wheels you're running. I think that's kind of obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, good good place to start is at the front. front yeah, we're so front to work pretty, our way back. Pretty simple. One of the things I loved about the bike was the spokes. Uh, the spoke rims are the ones that were, were on the bike when Karen got it for me. Uh, the tires, uh, the old Shinkos were the side, the white walls were kind of yellowed and the rubber was getting fairly hard. Uh, so kind of the last thing I did once I had it all together uh, in the spring, I decided to change it and put some fresh rubber on it. Just, you know, to make sure I didn't fall down or something right. in a corner. Yeah. yeah. So Shinko's uh, front so, and rear then? Yes. Nice. Yep. Excellent. I run Shinko's on my bikes too. Yeah. Nice tire. And of course with this, um, jumping to the back for a second, you'll notice the fender is fairly tight to the tire. Um, these are the tires that I use to set up the fender clearances and everything. So changing tire manufacturers, little different size, probably not a great idea a once I've done that. Because the fenders are tight. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Excellent. So when you were building this, like what, this is obviously not stock height. So what, let's talk about the suspension in the front. Like are they cartridge and dampeners in the front? Yeah, so it's a stock front end. Okay. Um, and I went through a lot of, uh, a lot of soul searching on this one. Uh, with the front end. Uh, there's a Springer right behind Harrison there. I thought about Springer and, and I knew that Paco Springers were really, really good. Um, and I, I thought, oh, should I put a Springer on it? And I called Paco and, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest and I'm not knocking Paco, the great company, good products and everything. I got a hold of a customer service guy and he said, okay, you need to measure this, measure that. I sent him pictures of the bike, did all the measurements and everything. And uh, I, was, I was really thinking I was going to pull the trigger on a Springer front end. And he ghosted me. I, I called into customer service. He wasn't in. Uh, I got no return call back. Uh, nobody wanted to help me, it seemed. I don't know if they didn't want to ship to Canada. I, I, I don't know what happened, but it got really awkward over the Springer. And yeah. I thought, you know what, Bruce? One of the things you really liked about the bike was the front end. So why are you trying to change that? And I scrapped the Springer idea and thought, there'll be another bike for a Springer. So I kept the same front end the bike had when I got it. Yeah. What I, what I didn't really like the uh, the lowers had been shaved, but they hadn't been nicely finished. They were painted matte black to hide all the sins. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so that had to be fixed. So I did uh, grind them and obviously polish them and got those cleaned up. The other thing is the bike sat a little bit nose up. Um, if you've got a long front end. I, you know, the Frisco style, Ooh, that, that front, front end up in the air, I love it. I got no issue with it. Yeah. But if your bike sits just a little high, so it's not really Frisco style, it's not really up there, but it's not really down there, it's kind of in no man's land, that's where I felt this one was. So I wanted to get the, the frame rails, the lower frame rails, parallel to the ground. Ooh, yeah and talk to the boys at PFX. And uh, Brent said, progressive suspension, lowering kit, that's the way to go. Uh, so I threw one in, uh, dropped it, uh, I think I went down two inches. Um, so it limits the travel a little bit, but it did exactly what I wanted. It got the frame rails lower uh, at the front and parallel to the ground. So now the bike has the stance. That yeah, I really want. for the people that are listening, this bike's got super smooth lines. It's it's an amazing build that looks super slick. For going from the forks, then, like let's talk about because this doesn't look like the factory neck, but it is. 
So it is. So you've customized this neck in some sort of way. Let's explain that a little bit. Sure. Because it's definitely sure. not like my Sportster. So Sportsters have, um, from the factory, on the lower triple tree, there are a couple large bumps, if you will, uh, that hit on a welded tab on the on the neck. Yeah. It's it's a very uh, how can I say it? it's a crude system. It, it very effective, but it's crude. It just it doesn't look nice, and there's this square stock tab there, yeah. stuck on the front. It's kind of an eyesore. Yeah, it, it just doesn't look that great. And then of course you add on the uh, the security system, which is that crazy tab with the hole drilled in it for putting a padlock yeah. through. And, you get all that going and it's like, really, this is the best, going on up front this is the best we could do Harley <laughs> Davidson. We got so much other nice stuff going on on Harley Davidson's and, and you got that hanging off the front end. So I really wanted to clean it up, uh, did some research, came up with an internal fork stop that is designed for the hourglass neck, okay. which this is not. Yeah, I was gonna say. But I looked at the pieces, did some measuring and everything, and I figured out that if I had the lower triple tree machined, yeah. get rid of the bumps, I had, to, I had to have part of it flattened out, and then I needed some holes drilled and tapped right in the right places. Okay. Uh, that's one of those things that I laid it out, it's my idea and everything, I simply don't have the machining tools to lock ask, it yeah. down and get it in the right position. So I took it down to, uh, I believe the name of the shop was Aaron's Machine Shop. Um, took it down there, the guys were great. Uh, you know, it cost me 100 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever it was. That's nothing. But they, they locked it down and got it centered and drilled the holes in the right place and it worked out really, really nice. Um, there was a little bit of work to get the, the what would you call it, the bearing height, the distance in there right to make sure that the seats were in the right place. Okay, uh, yeah. The cups were, the bearing cups were, were in the right place. But I got all that worked out and, uh, you know, if, uh, if you could see it, um, the clearances at the, at the surfaces are really nice. Uh, there's not big gaps, but nothing's rubbing. Uh, it worked out really, really well. Yeah, everything is So very really smooth. cleaned it up, uh, got rid of all those crazy tabs and bumps. Uh, I was able to polish up that lower. And uh, I think it looks, looks great and the stop is good. Uh, it limits the front wheel travel a little bit, but I'm usually trying to lean to turn more than I'm trying to turn the handlebars anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it worked out well. Did it change the feel of the front end at all? No. No? no so it's still like exactly, it yeah. still feels nice. Excellent. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, and then uh, I noticed also not the factory headlight. Not the factory headlight. There, there isn't uh, so much factory left the, on this thing, is well, there? No. no. Uh, You've been in, through it in all. A word, in a word. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, the, the factory mount is a big cast aluminum ugly thing right. uh, to me it was ugly uh, I apologize <laughs> yeah, I apologize to anybody with a sportster <laughs> it was ugly to me this particular one was ugly because somebody had taken a couple cuts at it and then painted it matte black and the the dewey the cap in the center that covers the mounting bolt Okay. Was kind of, I don't know if somebody left a, a rag with solvents on it on top of it, but it's a plastic piece and it all looked more like a vinyl roof in there Ooh, than uh, all corroded. Oh, and yeah, everything yeah, yeah, nasty. Yeah, so you gotta I thought, okay, that. that's got to go away. Yeah. I got the new mount and then I looked at the headlight and thought, oh, that headlight doesn't work with that mount. So. Then we went to work again, my, my buddies at PFX, we went through a couple lights to figure it out because what we needed, oh, and I'd have to go back and, and look at how this works, but we needed a bottom, bottom mount light that we could mount from the top. It's reverse of what it's supposed to be, but then we needed one by, by turning it upside down effectively to mount it the way we did, hanging down, we had to be able to take the ring and the headlight out 
and turn those 180 degrees so that the light projected from from the glass yeah. is, is correct. So, when so it, was, uh, it was a little bit of a job to get just the right light, but it is a chrome headlight with the chrome mount uh, and of course that big pike nut sticking up top there. Uh, so it all worked out pretty well and it, uh, it works great. Not a lot of vibration issues or anything like that. It's just fine. So I, I do like it. Uh, That's awesome. And, and as you can tell, I do like chrome, and that just kind of fit right in there. Yeah, you definitely seem like a chrome or go home. I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I'm sure. a reflection guy. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. the jewelry to all bikes, right? Yes, yeah, the bling. Don't black out the anything. Bling. Yeah, all chrome. Well, and then going from the front, then we talked about the forks. We talked about your neck. I think the neck is one of the most special parts about that bike. Obviously, you did that when this bike had was just bare frame. Yes. Yeah. So going from there... Let's talk about bar setup and, and apes. Why did you go with apes? Like where, that, was they, that your style? They were on the bike. They that were was, on the that bike was already. Part of what, so part of what I loved changed. about it. Yeah. Not changed. Those wow. are, All right. And even the, uh, are these Roland Sands? Yeah, Roland Sands yeah. grips you have? The yeah. Roland Sands grips were on there. Uh, the only thing that wasn't there is the switches were black. So I bought the Harley Chrome kit yeah. to chrome all the switches. Uh, I looked at, you know, going with Moto Gadget switches or something a little more sleek. And it just, you know, I, I had this and they, they look good and they function really well. And again, with the addition of the pike nuts, uh, pike nuts for anybody who's listening and not watching, if you haven't seen them, uh, got them from Lowbrow. They're, they're basically, uh, rather than an acorn nut, rather than being short, they have a tall spike on them. Yeah, and I was going to say, that they're just spiky nuts. Yeah, yeah. and the, the reason spiky. I went with them, and Harrison might not realize this yet, the reason I went with them is if you turn them sideways and look at the side profile, they look similar to a spade. Oh, okay. So I'm starting kept, to, okay, I can see it now. It, it kept with the spade, spade geometry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. all the angles, so, right? So everything had to get pike nuts wherever I could. Uh, so in this case, I used the pike nuts up on the handlebars. I think they look great. The thing about using nuts is I had Alfred in here for hours cutting pieces of threaded rod yeah. and grinding the, the ends to smooth them out and everything. Because the only way to make a bolt out of a nut is to put a piece of threaded rod in it. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. So that's, that's what's been done. That's quite in a tedious whole bunch of places. that's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. So. so, and then uh, obviously you got the one mirror. Well, you're yep. a one mirror kind of guy. So it's a, like just it's a, keeping it's it a, slick. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a retro, retro thing. thing. Yeah. Uh, I wanted a mirror on it. Um, but I didn't want two mirrors. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, one thing about me. I'm not big on symmetry. Okay. I, I don't care about symmetry. When I, and when I paint, and, and I'm not saying that, that I just hack it together, but things don't have to be symmetrical. Okay. It, it's okay when they are, but they don't necessarily have to be. All right. I love that. I love that. Well, Moving down from the bars now, the obviously all braided cable lines coming down. That's braided, a beautiful touch. Braided stuff is a common theme on the bike, and yep. uh, I'll touch on that right now. Uh, so the control cables are braided. Um, I forget what they call that. It's kind know, of a yeah. stainless. I was trying look. to think of it too, and I so lost they're it. they're a lighter color. They look great on the chrome bars uh, and Definitely. with the chrome holders and everything. That all that all ties together nicely. Yeah. All the electrical on this bike is run in braided brass. Yes, I had so seen that. So if yeah. you see brass braid. There's wires in there. In there, yep. And, I love that. And all the fluid lines, all the oil lines, are black braided hose. Those come, that's very common in the drag racing world. That's where I, don't, I, I don't get it from. I don't know if you know much yeah. about that one, would you? <laughs> yeah. I think it's uh, followed over to your bikes. That, um, that's great. And we'll, we'll talk more about those, but I just wanted to, you know, in an ideal world, would it have been nice to go with, everything brass braid 
Yeah, maybe, uh, but the problem is you can't get brass braided, or I couldn't find. I, I, I always get caught when I say yeah, that. Like, you can't get it. Yeah, oh, yeah, for that one. So I couldn't find brass braided um, AN hose. Uh, I, I could have gone aluminum or stainless or polished or whatever you want to call it. I didn't really like the stainless braided uh, AN hose because frankly it's been done to death. It's kind of it like has. black. It's been done to death. Yeah. Uh, and it just wasn't where I wanted to go. So I was able to reconcile that three different braids would would work. Yeah, I love it. I love it a lot. So going from the front, we're going to hit the meat and potatoes now of this bike. This okay. is going to be the best part for me, at least my favorite. <laughs> okay. So right now we got your Mr. Mojo tank on there, but I know yep. this bike has two different versions. And that's yes. what's exciting about this bike. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of that on how you... You came up with the color of the frame and then also two different paint jobs that kind of offered two different styles that you wanted to hit with one bike. Right. You kind of hit both of the best worlds with that, didn't you? I did. And, you know, I love, I love painting. Uh, this story, man, I could go on for hours. I believe uh, you. And, and eventually I will. Because <laughs> uh, I own the podcast, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so I'll say whatever I want. Keep going. Uh, so, because I love painting so much, I've gotten back into it, I'm really enjoying it. I wanted to be able to do two different paint jobs for the same bike, uh, and it had to tie together, obviously. It had to come together with something common. The other thing is, when I got this bike and took it, there used to be a shop in Calgary called Lucid, Lucid Moto, I think he called himself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a cool shop. They ran into financial issues anyway. Things happened there. It, it wasn't great. Uh, but there was a guy who worked there at one time, Dan. And Dan is a, uh, he's a British guy. I love Dan. I get a real kick out of him. He's got like one, I think he's got a gold tooth and another one's got a tattoo on it. Anyway, oh, nice. he's, I love he's that. a neat, neat dude. Uh, but Dan said to me when I had the bike in there for some service work, I went to pick it up and he said, that bike needs a sissy bar. And I went, shit, <laughs> did you have to say that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the gloves are off. It's back you know. in the building again. So that was the other thing that drove the two paint jobs is I wanted to do a sissy bar on this. Cause Dan was absolutely right. This bike needed a sissy bar. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And if uh, I'll try and explain for people listening and not watching this, the fender that came on the bike, which I, I love, it, it's a very cool, short, fat little fender, really accentuates the back tire. But this thing is so short that it doesn't actually come quite to the midpoint of the back tire. And if you look at where the mounts are for a sissy bar on the Harley frame, the sissy bar would have been leaning towards me, probably hitting me in the back of the head if, if I tried to tie that all together. <laughs> and I looked at putting tabs on the frame and trying to tie the fender in, and I sat here evenings and built things and clamped things on, and nothing looked right. Yeah. It just it wasn't going to work. So that's when I looked at it and went, okay, the only place the sissy bar is going to look right is coming off of, you know, right at the back axle. And I thought, how do I make this happen? So I went to Lowbrow and found a Stingray fender with, with the rib down the center, and I went, that's going to do the trick. Yeah, I love that so, second center um, fender. For, for you listening, you're not going to get to see it. Uh, maybe if you get a chance to go to the YouTube, go check it out. Yeah, we'll for the for the YouTube here. watchers, I'm going to try and drop some pictures in so you can see what it looks like with the other set of tins on it and the and the yeah. sissy bar. Uh, but that was that was one of the motivating factors for the for the extra set of tins as well is just to get that sissy bar tied in. Yeah. So having longer fender, I thought okay. 
how do I do one tank with that? That's not going to work. So alien tank, again, from lowbrow. The alien tank looked great with the Stingray Fender. Yeah. Tied together nicely. Picked up the alien tank to stay true to the original uh, design of the bike or, or the way it was when, when I got it. It had a sporty tank on it, which had some custom paint on it. Uh, the custom paint, I kept that tank. Uh, it hangs on the wall in the shop here. I'll, I'll post a picture of that. Um, I kept that tank because the, the paint was cool enough. I didn't want to sand it off. I didn't, didn't want to destroy that tank. It's a tank. good memory of where the bike came from. Exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. So I bought a direct replacement, uh, same size, style, and everything for the tank that was on it. Um, the reason that I went ahead and used the rear fender and, and ground the paint job off of it is the tank and fender were not painted at the same time. Once I had the bike, I realized I got looking at the silver and I got looking at the shadowing. Wasn't the same guy and it wasn't the same paint. Uh, which for, for most people, taking a look at the bike, nobody ever noticed. Yeah, from 10 feet away. But once I knew it, yeah that would that was it yeah. couldn't, couldn't live with it um so i did reuse this short squat little fender yeah changed the mounting system from from what was here because it again it was kind of crude it wasn't wasn't real clean i think we're learning that you're um, quite a perfectionist which is it shows well, it's showing you know yeah it's nice i guess i guess what i'd say to that is i try my best i i like doing stuff uh, and I like being challenged to do things differently. Uh, so I do try my best to make things work out. I look at guys like Rick Bray at RKB and, and um, Max Hazen, uh, guys like that. I look at the stuff they do and I think, I am such a fucking hack. I just, like, it's brutal. But I, I do my best and, you know, I'm probably middle of the pack maybe I you know you, yeah. maybe top 60 yeah, percent or something too but, much yeah. on this episode so uh, so i do i do try but we did clean that up that worked out really well yeah so now i had the two sets of tins the two different designs the yeah. sissy bar i knew where i was going and i thought okay how do i how do i connect this how do i have one frame with the tins and everything yeah how the one and, color matches uh, both and i went to the gold uh, it's House of Color. I only use, at this point, I only use House of Color. I used it uh, uh, 40, 45 years ago when, when I got into doing auto body as a kid. Uh, I used it back then. I trust it. I really like their system. It's easy to put things together and make things happen. So this is what House of Color calls Spanish white gold. Uh, I'm not sure that I quite matched the color chip um, because mixing by volume rather than by weight, I may have been out a little bit, but it's okay. It, uh, I loved it. I loved it how this out. color turned out. And, and what I did, and I'm... Uh, He's picking gotta, up the tank right now. Yeah, I got to try and describe this. So I have the alien tank here. Um, the alien tank has... Uh, gold stripes, a gold stripe down the center and then off to the sides. The Sportster tank has a gold border around it. Uh, and on both of those, it's the same gold that's on the frame. Both paint jobs, I'm, I'm pretty happy. They tie in really nicely to the frame. Yeah. Nothing looks like it's stuck on. It looks like it was meant to be there. It, it definitely flows um, with the frame for sure. And I, yeah. I can't believe you just put, we'll have to talk about that alien frame. Oh, we'll get back to it. We'll get sure. back to it. Yeah. So that was the idea. I tied it, tied it together with the gold. Um, on the Sportster tank, I went with uh, kind of an ivory color that I mixed up. Again, House of Color, super simple. Uh, used their bright white uh, base and just mixed a little bit of the gold candy into the white to tint it a little bit to kind of an off-white almondy kind of color yeah and did inlays on the side and one down the center uh, with some striping around them 
very happy with the way that worked out. I did the stencil for the name on the side uh, and I'm happy with the way that turned out. And then, then the challenge came with the white panels on there. I thought, okay, what, what do I do? And it certainly had a little bit more of a retro style or retro look to it. And there's a fellow in Calgary here. Um, his name's Gary Miller. He's gone by the name Gamboogie for years. Uh, Gary is a great guy and a very talented striper. Um, he might not like it if I told you his age, so I'm just going to say that Gary's retired. Uh, and I, I wanted a Gamboogie original. I wanted pinstriping that was from Gamboogie, yeah. and, and it's kind of going to be part of the legacy of this bike. It's going to go on forever. Yeah. So I took the tank, the uh, Sportster tank and the shorty little fender, took those down to Gary, and they already had the ivory panels and everything on them. And I said, okay, I want you to stripe this. And he looked at it and he said, well, I'm not doing a lot of jobs anymore, but yeah, I'll do this one for you. And uh, he said, what do you want on it? And I said, you're not listening. I want a Gamboogie original. Yeah, free reign. And he said, what? And I said, do your thing. Like, there's the panels, there's the pieces. Do your thing. I think that's every artist's he, wet dream. Yeah, and he yeah. said to me, he said, oh, okay, what colors do you want? And I said, again, you're not listening. <laughs> yeah. I said, I don't care. Yeah. I did, these are the colors that are on the bike, the gold and the ivory, the rest of it's chrome, so you can do whatever color you want. And he said, oh, and he, he sounded a little bit lost at the time. He called me up about two weeks later and he said, your tank and fender are ready. And uh, I went and picked them up and they are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, they turned out uh, amazing. His, his striping, his style, this is definitely some of his work with the, for, again, for the listeners, uh, there's some stars, uh, there's lots of little dots. There's lots of nice little detail. Um, very, very happy with it. And it on the rear fender, it does say right where everybody can see it, Gamboogie 2022. Yeah. Uh, and this provided we don't ever have a, a catastrophe or a crisis, these will go into history with uh, It brings with the, the bike Gamboogie. into a piece of artwork. And it's, it's not, not just, just a bike. Anymore. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, and I think for the listeners, like, uh, say my view, it kind of looks like a pinstriped, beautiful spaceship going out into space with like a huge amount of flames at the bottom. Oh, Harrison, look at you go. Feeling artistic, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right? Because, uh, and they both, the one on the tank matches the same one on the fender and, uh, one of the tanks got a little bit more flames coming out of it. They're not flames though, but it's yeah. definitely a space shuttle. I, I can I can see that yeah. now. But I love freehand pinstriping. Oh my oh, goodness, do I wish I the had generations the of that. Yeah, but I, I, but I at this point in life, I can barely drink from a can without <laughs> spilling it all over myself. Oh my I never God, pull we a all line. have those yeah. days. Uh, yeah. Well, let's so. get to the meat and potatoes of this bike here, because I know that it started as an 883. Actually, I'm going to stop you there oh. for a second, because I do want to talk about one other thing okay. I did on the tanks. All right. So these are, what, what is this? This is a Frisco mount yep. where you have the curved tab at the front and back of the tank. Yeah. And I love the mounting system because it's really simple. It's really easy to get at. It's super clean but too. But here, it can be. Here's the problem I have. All right. I, I watched uh, some videos about how to mount these. And what most guys are doing is you've got the, the backbone of the bike and then the, the tab on the tank just kind of rests on that backbone. And I looked at that and I, I looked at some some bikes that had it mounted that way and what happens is the tab can shift a little bit on the backbone yes and you get some some chafing and some rubbing going on there and and of course if you do your own paint you you kind of are fond of 
of what you just did. <laughs> yeah, you're proud of your work, yeah. yeah. So, so I looked at that, and I thought, you know, I, can, I think I can do that a little bit better. Long story short, Alfred and I sat down, and we, we took a close look at this. And we drilled into the tab, the, the hole that was there for like a 5 16 bolt. Yeah. We drilled that out to about a half inch. And we made little half inch washers that would fit in the hole that we drilled. Okay. So then we welded the washer into the hole. And then I did a little bit of smoothing on the backside and a little bit of, of filler work to smooth it all out. Okay. I bought bungs, threaded bungs from Lowbrow, top hat bungs. Yeah. That drill the hole in the backbone, drop the bung in, weld the bung, and now you got a flat spot being the bung. So now both of these tanks are mounted a flat spot to a flat spot yep. with the bolt through it. And just for extra care love and, and yeah, love and affection, I got some of these cool leather washers from Lowbrow, slipped one of those in there. So now the tank is very solid. You've got flat surface on flat surface with that little leather washer between there. Yeah. No, no chafing, no rubbing, no shifting, no nothing. Uh, and I, I like the look. And the only difference is the, the tab now sits, what, three-eighths of an inch up off the backbone, yeah, which I find totally acceptable. Yeah. I, I'm okay with the look. Well, in here I thought you were just cutting your chaps up, you know? Yeah. And putting yeah. your chaps underneath your tank. <laughs> Uh, Nostalgia, right? Stuff, yeah, right? I thought, yeah, yeah there, there you go. You're just keeping you memories go. on a new build, you know. <laughs> and then you bought them, so good to know. Yeah. I didn't know those. I didn't know you could buy those. All right, now can we talk about the sure. meat and potatoes? Yep, absolutely. Okay. All right, so I know that it started as an 883, and going from an 883, it, was it that you just didn't like the up of an 883? You needed more, or how did? Because how, now it's a 1273. 1275. 1275. Yeah, 1275. Right. So for me, Harrison, this is all art. And, you know, when I, when I see a picture of an aluminum engine block with pistons in it and the heads aren't on yet or anything, you see that aluminum and you see those pistons and the domes and whatever. I, that is art to me. And oh, yeah. I, I look at that and I think about everything that goes on in that engine when it's running. And I think about the aluminum connecting rods and that how they're machined and that somebody designed them and that stuff. It's all art. It's part of it. It's beautiful. So for me, this bike isn't getting raced. It's not doing anything like that. And it has, as an 883, it had enough power to scare me. Yeah, I'll uh, race you with my 883. Yeah, like this, it's, it's crazy. But I wanted to build kind of the, the nicest piece of art that Ooh, I could. Okay. Uh, so that meant going as big as you could go Definitely. currently, yeah. you know, without crazy modification. I wanted to go big, I wanted to make it work right, do all those things, and of course from my racing days, building race engines. I was going to say, it kind of brings I, I the like hot run into it. it. Yeah, I'm kind of challenged with it. For sure. And uh, that's where we headed. <clears throat> awesome. What, what 1273 or 1275 kit did you put in it? What brand? I went with Hammer Performance. Okay. Uh, and I, I will tell you... There's lots of 1250 and 1275 kits out oh, there. Yeah, I was gonna say Everybody's hundreds. doing a good job. No, no criticism. But as a race guy, when I went to Hammer's website and read the information and the support material and watched the videos, um, these guys just know these engines and they know them really, really well. Uh, you know, Hammer Dan, Hammer Dan's a riot. His videos are great. You got to watch it sometime. Oh, I've got to check him out now. You know, you can tell Hammer Dan is a oily hands, get it done kind of guy. Um, Aaron, uh, Aaron 
is a totally different dude from Hammer Dan. Uh, Hammer Dan's the guy that you would sit down and have a beer with after, after putting one of these together. Uh, Aaron is kind of the, I hope I'll probably get a heat mail on this one, but he's kind of the mad scientist and he's a little bit dry and he's, you know, he's not going to be, uh, he's not going to be super friendly with you, but he's going to tell you exactly what has to happen to make that motor work and you better listen. Hey, we all need one of those guys in our yeah. lives. So, so uh, Aaron, Aaron's awesome and his understanding, his knowledge phew, blows me away. Uh, so between the two of them and all the guys at Hammer Performance and even the shipper, she's a sweetheart. Uh, they did everything for me and I just, uh, super happy with that with hammer awesome yeah and then uh the pipes did we did you make these pipes or did you buy these are them? paco okay uh these are paco here i'll let this camera get a shot there those are paco upswept uh when i got the bike the first thing i changed was the exhaust because it had those crazy snake pipes that came out right at your foot. Oh yeah, love to burn uh, right yourself. Down, yeah, right yeah. down in the center. And the first time I fired it up, it blew a flame about a foot and a half long out past my leg. And I thought, okay, I don't like this. Oh, that just, uh, that's just that, what makes riding fun, brother. You know? <laughs> that's go away. So I put these on. Uh, the sound out of these pipes is fantastic. It's just straight piped. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure Aaron at Hammer Performance would disagree Ooh, with. Yeah, he's not he wasn't. Like you for that. He wasn't happy that I was taking the VOES off of the bike either. Oh. Uh, but again, to me, basics art. I don't have space for that vacuum no, stuff. No, nobody does. And you know what? My race engines run ah, full throttle, and they run just fine. Yeah. Uh, I know I'm not running full throttle all the time with this. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? There's absolutely no reason that this can't work oh it'll handle without it. voes so yeah. that's where we're at awesome uh, and then uh even to the like looking getting into detail here all the covers on this bike have been polished and i see you've got oh man what would be the right word for these rib ribs in your ignition that yes like, uh the rib cover, cover uh and the the points, points cover or the ignition cover, yeah, ignition cover and the derby cover are both from Moon. Okay. Uh, Moon Eyes products. Uh, again, if you want to talk about nostalgia, what's more nostalgic than Moon Equipped? Yeah. Um, I thought they were pretty cool. I haven't seen those on any bike in this area. I haven't uh, either. Yeah. Very different. Uh, and the the one that was on this side that came with the bike said something about. Uh, live, ride, ride, ride to live, live to ride. It die, die to ride. Anyway, die it had ride. die in there, and and I'm not a big guy to invite death, so I uh, just thought, yeah, we don't need to say die on there. Gotcha. We'll get rid of that. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Yeah, and then when you did the hardtail conversion here, was did, what did you have to do to the chain setup? Hold on, I'm gonna back up. All right, to the let's back again. up. Okay. Back, back up to the engine, Makuni carburetor, all kinds of modifications that Hammer recommended. Uh, I shipped the heads down to Hammer. They reworked the heads. Okay. Um, yeah. The 1275 kit, amazing. They do the assembly on it, so it came back. The jugs had the pistons already in them. Um, yeah. All you had to do was, was do up the connecting rods. Oh, that's um, easy. Uh, yeah, so it uh, it was pretty easy to install the stuff. Uh, they recommended a bronze gear drive for the oil pump. They recommended the new oil pump with the bigger scavenging yeah, section. Yeah, big power. You need um, a lot of cooling. Yeah, yeah, different different rotor on the charging system because it goes on with more bolts and it's stronger and won't fail. And there were just a whole bunch of things that Aaron said. Well, if you're going to build this motor. If you really want to do it right, this is what you should do. Yeah, We've seen you, these you things. You can't fail. cut corners when you're making big. So power. we, yeah, like we, that's just uh, the way of the game. Pretty much everything that Aaron recommended, I went with. Yeah, uh, I did it because I wanted this thing to work. Uh, first time I fired it up, it fired right up. I followed their break-in procedures to a T. Really? This you you this can hold motor, yourself back. 
Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh no, uh, they're uh, they're very specific about how you break their motors in, yeah. uh, and this motor is flawless. It makes great oil pressure. Uh, it runs great. The Makuni carburetor is fantastic. Yeah. Everything about this is exactly the way I wanted it, and Excellent. and super happy. The push rod covers are yeah. a funny story. Okay, hit me with that. Because the ones I had were really bad. They were dented and scraped and all kinds Ooh, of stuff. Just yeah, they were ugly. Aged. And being a 1996, I went over to Calgary Harley Davidson and I said, "Yeah, I need push rod tubes." And they said, "No, that's not going to happen." And uh, yeah, they were obsolete. So the guys at CHD did me a favor and they did a search to see if there were any out there. And sure enough, uh, there were four on the shelf in Ramouski, Quebec. And That's I called surprising. the guys in Ramouski yeah. and they went and checked and sure enough they had them and they purulated them to me. So that is the last set of chrome pushrod tubes for this vintage of Sportster uh, in Canada. I don't, we didn't check the US, but I got the last ones in Canada. Wow. So kind of nice, they are fresh, chrome, they're beautiful, they're perfect, um, and I'm very happy to have them. Yeah, they do look gorgeous. We should get a shot of that for them too. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, yes. excellent. And then coming from there, like uh, Makuni Carb, love it. I have a Makuni on uh, my 96 Electric Glide. I have no problems with it. Um, and then we got to talk about this oil tank. This, there, so for everyone listening, this is a beautiful oil tank with a spade on it um and it's just positioned right and it looks slick but you gotta tell me about it is that embossed is that the right word for that i would say yeah because it's stamped it's, i don't it's, a, yeah i, I, I think, think it's embossed because stamped would yeah. be it, it, an indent oh okay right okay like so, so yes the, the bike came with that oil tank, tank. again it was matte black uh and had the spade on the sides with uh, red pinstriping outlining the spade. Hmm. And it didn't look bad. Oh. It, it looked pretty good. Right. I, I was okay with it for a long time. Seat's black, so it kind of it kind of went together. Once I got all the polishing done and trimmed up that uh, the cover on this side to expose the chrome gear on the chain and all, yeah. uh, chrome sprocket, I should say, pardon me, uh, and the chrome Paco exhaust and all that, that tank needed to be chrome. So yeah. I, I did go ahead and chrome it, but it is the original tank that came on it. So again, one of those things that I've maintained because I liked it. Nice, excellent. All right, well, and then it, it, I guess we gotta ask, is there anything changed in the trans for gearing wise? Or? Transmission is just, just stock, factory. just yeah. the way it should be. Energy one clutch, again, hammer big performance. Big power, yeah. big upgraded clutch, yeah, has upgrade to. Upgrade the clutch. Yeah. Um, the scenes how we're right there. The speedometer yeah. uh, is an interesting piece. Um, I see you have to look down. It's a drag specialties speedometer. And it's right in um, front of the seat here. It, it sits right, right on my thigh. Um, let me put it this way. I have never seen that speedometer when I'm riding the bike. I believe you, but you're always hugging the speed. And that's the whole point of it, because the law says you shall have a speedometer. Yeah. And this is my rebellious side saying, there, I got a speedometer. All right. Can't see the thing, but it's, it's there. there. Right? Yeah, and you're just um, hugging it the whole time. What was interesting with this is it was originally mounted off of the backbone. Uh, there was just a tab welded on there. And when I went to take the engine apart, uh, it turned out that once we had the cover off the top, you couldn't get that push rod out because it hit the bottom of the Oh yeah, the bottom the of the tab. speedo. Yeah. Not, not just the speedo, but the bottom of the tab, which is welded to the backbone. Oh, oh yeah. Great. yeah. So the only way to get that push rod out was to actually take the engine out of the frame and then pull the push rod out. That's so I, yeah. I decided at that point that I would incorporate the mount into the seat hinge yeah. and mount. 
and that's what I've done there. So now it, uh, it sits with that. So when you take the seat off, the speedo's out of the way, and now that push rod comes, comes out, out. Everything's good. And, uh, and again, since we're here, we got to talk about how did you end up with the Springer seat? That's the one that came on it. No way. Those are the same beehive springs. That really? is exactly the way that came. And again, did you bronze the springs? Nope. They wow. were like that. Okay. So trying to maintain as much of that original bike that I fell in love with, yep. uh, you know, I wanted to keep that. Excellent. Excellent. Right on. Well, I'm moving our way to the back. I've got some things that I want to come back to in the middle here, but though that's just a good big topic that I want to land on okay. there. Um, chain and sprocket kit, is this what came with the bike? Or did yes. you, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Same right, thing. So then nothing, you didn't have to change anything there. I did do a chrome uh, Cover. rear master cylinder. Oh, master cylinder. Uh, uh, another lowbrow piece. Uh, yeah. yeah that just needed to happen the old one was black and ugly and, and then yeah. i noticed we keep the same what did you call these nuts pike pike nuts, nuts all yep. around so I'm just, i'll just call them spiky nuts <laughs> spiky nuts all the way around the bike and then uh another thing that we didn't touch on on the front that is a theme too is the bullet signals yes i love those they they they're cool they they're, don't they're yeah. chrome they're small they work just to fine. keep it classy they don't bring your eye to anything thanks it's nice yeah. and then uh yeah all the way to the back here we've got your stop classic brake light yes is that and that's not factory clearly not factory uh the is there a story light, behind it uh yeah a little bit of one the light came on the bike the rear brake when i got the bike was mounted up top here oh, okay and it was it was okay but it was really out there it was kind of big and gaudy and it's a and, visual point yeah, for people I, I didn't love it so i went over to at the time lucid um to figure out what to do about a license plate mount so tim the fabricator who now works at uh, precision great guy tim, tim's a great guy love tim uh he said well why don't you make your own and uh oh you love hearing me, those words he got me a piece of plate and he showed me how he bends it in a vice and this and that yeah. and turned me loose and i bent it all no and he said, way. okay i've got a pattern for this bracket and we tied it in this is um this is right on the axle and this is where the chain adjuster comes into play so the chain adjuster actually holds this from going up and down oh nice and then did you mount the rear brake differently at the same time you made the license brake bracket no i had left it where it was it oh, wasn't no. until i tore it apart that i decided to change that. And what the, brake, the brake rear brake uh setup is that then? that is stock okay and that's even the stock bracket cut up a whole bunch ah uh, and then just so flipped flipped down yeah uh, used this little, um, uh, you know, uh, little adapter here with rod ends, kind of tied in nicely. Yep. Uh, allowed for a couple more pike nuts, which was, uh, you know, always good, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so a couple more pike nuts there, and uh, so far that works real well. Yeah, um, it's a gorgeous look, too, and it keeps the brake. It almost brings the flow from the front to the back even more aggressive to what it are what it was previously yes yes and then on looking on this side there's a lot of interesting stuff going on over here too this stamped spade in the back is it's a gold or brass polished spade so that was that was made by a friend of ours uh who did that all by hand um it is it's a great piece uh i had a couple people last summer mention that they thought it was real nice detail work to have that on there. Um, I I will share with you though yeah. why it's there. Okay. Because Bruce is a dumbass. Oh, all okay. right. And uh, I had the frame. I brought it back from the paint booth, and I'm sure builders can relate to this kind of stuff. I bring the thing back from the paint booth, and I had it over there in front of my bench. And I was going to do something and I had to grab the air hose and the air hose slipped out of my hand and the coupler 
came down and smacked the frame Ooh. right on the top. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, oh yeah. I noticed yeah. it. Yeah. And took a chip out of my brand new paint. Ooh. I I lost my shit. I just about took it and tied it to the back of the suburban and dragged it up and down the alley just to really destroy it. Yeah. But I uh, I calmed down and I thought, okay, what can I do? Um, so for for those of you who follow, subscribe, or whatever it is you do, you now know Bruce's secret that there's a hunk of paint missing from under that gold space. Hey, you never know, but it's a good thing that we're all carrying that with you now. Does it feel better that it's off your chest too? Actually, it does. I yeah. believe you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's good therapy session. It is a good Harrison. therapy. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. I'm here for you. Um, all right. Well. Kind of clears up the back for us. Uh, beautiful, like description of a lot of these like intricate things that you put on this bike. Um, I really got to hit a, a a point here though. A lot of this electrical is super clean, and on a lot of bikes like my sporty, it's everywhere. Right. So let's talk about like what you deleted, um, and and just your view on what you wanted the electrical on this bike to be because it's fairly seamless. You don't get to see a lot of what's going on. Right. So. Right. And the electrical on this bike uh, left left some things to be desired. It, it wasn't the cleanest. Um, the plastic box that everything was mounted in wasn't the best. Uh, lead acid battery down in the bottom where they typically all are. Yep. Uh, strapped in with a rubber or whatever. Anyway, it, and you got uh, that leaking acid everywhere. Yeah, it was fairly typical um, and, and not not terrible. But I thought I can do better than this. All right. Um, one thing I've always loved, uh, especially on a cafe racer like the XS650 we're working on right now. Um, I've always liked a big open area in that triangle of the frame. Ooh, yeah, I'm a sucker I, for that too. Yeah, yeah, I've always thought that looked good. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to achieve that. But in, in thinking that way, I was able to come up with a box that is mounted under the seat. Uh, it's, yeah, it's actually mounted under the seat mounting bar. Um, it's kind of a funny shape. It has an angle at the bottom just to give it a little bit of, of geometry, a little bit of style. And that box houses my lithium iron phosphate battery, my moto gadget, uh, all the wiring, the fuses and everything, and the oil pressure gauge. Yeah. And I, I, I put the oil pressure gauge in there just because you should probably never run oil lines in with all your electrical. Yeah. But if you do it right, it works. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. And it looks and, cool. And it's kind of neat because before I jump on, I just take a look under here. The gauge is mounted right under the seat. It's in the top of the box. Oh, yeah, that is very uh, slick. And I can, I can get a look at it. I don't need to see it once, once everything's running and I'm riding. Uh, but it's kind of a nice diagnostic or, or maintenance thing. Yeah. So, so that, that was the point there was to try and and get a box that hit everything that was clean. It. Yeah. And Didn't and I think it cleaned it up a lot. Uh I wouldn't mind building a new box at some point to go in there. Oh, yeah, because bikes are never done. No. Yeah. And I and I would probably chrome it. That one's not bad. I'm just not super happy with the access door. I think I could have done better there. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's, that's something, something that may change down the road, but but the concept is good. I think it worked out fairly well. Yeah, I'm loving it. And uh, yeah, the components, um, Moto Gadget, excellent product. Yeah, can't say enough about Moto I've, Gadget. I've got to stop you right there because I feel like we've got to say that there is no no keys, nothing on this no bike. Keys. There, you don't. It doesn't seem. Uh, Either it's very well hidden, or you don't need any? Don't need keys. Yeah, you don't need keys, yeah. okay. So what I did is the Moto Gadget, so Moto Gadget's an excellent product. Uh, that thing is indestructible, makes wiring so easy. 
Beautiful thing about Moto Gadget, it's all ground activated rather than voltage activated. Excellent, yeah. So there are 22 gauge wires running through the handlebars because all you're doing is grounding the input. You're, there's no current, there's no voltage, or very little current. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll have hate mail about saying that. To all no the current. electricians yeah. out there. Uh, so uh, running grounds is really, really easy. Yeah. And, and and very safe too. You don't have any situations where um, a, a wire with 12 volts on it can chafe and ground out to the edge Give of a, a hole touch, or anything you know? like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so nice nice system. Can't say enough about Moto Gadget, except the Moto Gadget FOB system. Yeah. I, th I think they missed the mark. They can refine uh, it a little bit and, better? Well, or is it big? It's, it's refined. I feel like people it's, don't know very much typical, about this Moto Gadget. Yeah, it's typical of Moto Gadget stuff. It's very nice. I mean, they're, they're mirrors and they're blinkers and they're, they're uh, Moto Gadget. What the, what the heck is that thing called? Anyway, it's their, their wiring base Box? system. Okay, fuse, um, fuse panel. No, yeah, sort of, but okay. uh, it's the brain, if you will, Yeah, and, and I can't remember what they call it, but anyway, uh, the Moto Gadget brain is excellent, it's all good, but even as the guys at Revival Cycle say in their video, the FOB system is, it's almost like a coin, a metal coin okay. that goes on your keychain, Yeah, and there's a sensor that you have to mount on the bike in a position where you can pass the coin under it. Oh. So you need to have the sensor and then you have to take the coin out of your pocket and pass it within, it's fairly tight, it's like within a half inch or something. Oh wow. You have to, you have to pass this coin past the sensor and that will enable the ignition system. And I, I, I didn't like that. As the guy at Revival says, if you're going to reach in your pocket and take something out, why wouldn't you just take a key out? Exactly. Yeah. I found a company called Digital Guard Dog. Awesome, awesome product. Fantastic. Um, I haven't heard of them either. Digital Guard Dog has a true... Uh, RFID, radio frequency, whatever. Oh, just like, like our whatever. key fobs in cars. Just yeah, and like Harleys, fobs yeah. in cars. Their fob has two different settings. You can either set it so that you have to push the button yeah. to activate the system. Uh, it's not my favorite setting. <laughs> or you can set it so that as long as the fob is within four feet of the bike, it activates the system. Okay. So very simple on this bike. I, I will share with you, the Digital Guard Dog is not mounted in the metal box because the guys at Digital Guard Dog said that would be a really bad idea with radio frequency in yeah. a steel box. Yeah. That wasn't the best plan. Even weirder. So the uh, Digital Guard Dog is actually mounted right under the center of the engine. Oh, okay. Where Unless you know it's there, you wouldn't know it's there. Oh, well, now we all know. I have to now you, Now you all know, yeah. yeah. And, and it's mounted with pike nuts, I might add. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah it see totally them, is. See them down there? Yeah. Wow. Man, yeah, for all the people so, that want to look under Bruce's bike, you really should take a gander down there. <laughs> so the digital guard dog is down there. The way the system works with the fob in my pocket, I walk up, I flip the run stop switch to run and hit the start button and away it goes. Flip it back off, walk four feet away from the bike, system's disabled, everything's good. That is slick. Uh, yes, and, and tying, nowhere could I find where anybody had ever tied a digital guard dog to a moto gadget. So that took a little bit of, of engineering. We sat down and worked that out and called the guys at Digital Guard Dog and said, this is what we think should happen. Is this right? And uh, good customer support. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Not the friendliest guys in the world. Okay. Uh, but okay. factual. Yeah, they, they said, got the job done They for said, you. don't put it in a steel box. And yes, you're looking at the wiring the right way. That will work. I love that. Um, so that's what we did there. Okay. And then is the ignition system the same? So like uh, spark plugs and uh, coils? 
It's, it's a, a Dyna 2000 ignition Excellent. module, uh, which is what Hammer recommends. Okay. Um, which is updated from what it was. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I went with some nice fat ignition wires. Who's our, oh, those are Excels. I relocated the coil because I, I wanted to keep, and I'm going to just scoot around front here for a second. I wanted to keep this area very clean. This is where the ignition switch and coil would typically be. Yep. And it blocks the view of that beautiful hammer performance billet aluminum intake. I wanted people to be able to see that. I wanted this top motor mount clean, so I shaved a bunch of it off, uh, ground it, had it chromed. Uh, the choke is right here between the cylinders, yep. right below the intake. And when you look at the bike on this side, you're looking right at the intake manifold, which I like. Yeah. So I mounted the coil back at the back on this electrical box. Was a little bit concerned about the coil being that close to the moto gadget, uh, but we don't seem to get any interference. It works, and I think it's because we have a steel box there shielding the, uh, the moto gadget. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. all polished cases over there. Beautiful, yeah. And then, of course, in the electrical system, the final thing, and, and you and I are going to try and add something on yeah. to the video or do a separate video about this, but the lithium iron phosphate battery, add, yeah. this technology is amazing. It's yeah. so cool, and there have been horror stories about putting lithium batteries in Harleys and different issues and everything. I can tell you that once you put a moto gadget in, rewire the thing, do a digital guard dog. There is no issue with a lithium battery in there. It charges fine, the system works, there's no overcharging. The, everything works just the way it's supposed to. Um, one of the things, do you know the difference between lithium ion and lithium iron phosphate? Ooh, that's a tough one, and you know, I've got to say I don't. We're going to try and get an expert to tell us more about this, but my research so far right. tells me lithium ion is good, but lithium ion can overheat and can start a fire. Yes, oh very much so. Lithium iron phosphate will live for approximately four to five times as many cycles and lithium iron phosphate will not overheat or catch on fire. Oh, no way. So that's, oh, we've that's what I've we've read. We've definitely got to dive into so we that. We need to talk to somebody. For sure. That yeah. battery is five and a quarter inches by two and a half inches by three and five eighths. I don't think a lot of people would remember the dimensions of their battery, but that was very impressive. Thanks, like, buddy. Yeah, I like that. Not bad for an old yeah, guy. Yeah, I know. You're really yeah. showing off yeah. here. Weird flex, but all right. Uh, so, so anyway, yeah. uh, we're, we're going to dig into battery technology because, man, that just cleans it up. It's in that box. Is, yeah. There's no fumes. There's no leaks. There's no nothing. Uh, it's light. Uh, lithium, well, lithium batteries, especially for me, lithium iron phosphate, I think is fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think that was a great cat like caption up this bike for sure. Um, I do have one question though, um, yeah. and it's about your first build and how it affected this build, your bike Frankie. How did that, did you put any of that love and inspiration into the here or was this a completely different idea for you? And if people don't know the build it's, Frankie, um, it was a uh, K KZ 440? Yep. Yeah. Yep. A beautiful bike that built Bruce for his daughter-in-law. Yes. Yeah. Good for you. I know. See, your memory's pretty I'm, sharp I'm, I'm too. Yeah. Going on. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So, did you bring any of that into this bike, Bruce, or was this such kind of a clean state to start something new? You you bring your paint in, uh, you know, uh, metal flake on Frankie. No metal flake here, but the the whole concept of custom paint. Yeah, you bring that with you, uh, polishing, uh, detail, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so detail pieces, just to give you a quick example. Yeah. On the alien tank, I made the gas cap for it, 
and you were asking about spades. Yeah, I've got also here the story so about the spades. There, but. there are spades airbrushed on the green paint job on the alien tank. But when Karen and I were down in Orlando, uh, we went to Universal to the Hard Rock Cafe. Okay. And when I was there, I saw these bottle opener metal playing cards that have this big ace in the center. Yeah. And, uh, or a big spade, I should say. Yeah. And I said to Karen, I said, I need to buy a couple of those because I'm going to build that into one of my projects someday. And I was thinking specifically of this one because we already had this bike. Yeah. And I thought, I'm going to make that work someday. And so what I've done for the people listening is I built a, a post for on the gas cap and mounted the corner of the bottle opener into that post. Uh, so this Ace of Spades bottle opener, which says Hard Rock Cafe Orlando on it, uh, is sticking up and that's that's one of those little detail things Harrison that I like to do because I look at it and it it's a fond memory and I know Karen looks at it and goes that's pretty cool that, that that's there and yeah, we bought a lot of cards we remember being at Universal and doing the roller coasters and all yeah. that stuff so it's fun stuff definitely to, and that is that. That, and that kind of set the seat like theme for the rest and on the Kawasaki yeah Tracy loves Harry Potter Okay. And when we were at, where, where's Harry Potter? Uh, uh, yeah. Universal, I, I guess that's where they have Harry Potter. Too. Yeah. I'm not a big Harry Potter guy, but anyway. I don't read. We found a, a keychain that had a little, kind of like a coin in the center that spun. Yeah. And she fell in love with this keychain, so I bought an extra one. And when I did her Kawasaki, I relocated the ignition switch because I redid all the electrics on it, moved the ignition switch to the back under the, the seat pod and had this gap between the gauges. And I thought, wait a minute. So I mounted this keychain to fill that gap. Yeah. And what was really cool was the first time I test rode the bike and got going down the road, I realized that the air movement spun the coin in the nice. center. That's right? perfect. And that's, that. that's probably Tracy's favorite part of the bike. She loves that Harry Potter awesome. keychain on there. So I like building little details in like yeah, that and where then I built, can. From there, you built them uh, into here. Cafe Racer is a totally different bike than this. Yeah. You know, choppers are different, but it's all just craftsmanship art and detail and yeah, passion yeah awesome well is there any other well oh, okay. I, I actually for the viewers your gas tank that you have on the bike now the sportster tank we're gonna just we'll probably end on this but it looks like a milk carton like gas cap how did you get that it's actually a lowbrow gas cap. It oh. was chrome. I took it, sanded it down, and when I did the ivory, I painted the gas cap yeah. as well. Looks like it, it's super cool. I, I haven't seen a gas cap painted in a while. It, thank you. It's it's clean. Yeah. And the nice thing is you don't notice it. No. You it notice the in. chrome on the handlebars. You notice the the speedometer. You notice the pinstriping. Yeah. But the gas cap doesn't jump out at you no, and say, "Hey, look at me." Exactly. Right. Well, and obviously two different themes. We have one with a bottle opening card, so the yeah. ace of spades on there, <laughs> yes. and then we have one that you don't even want to know where you put in the yeah. gas. You know? Yeah. I love it. Well, Bruce. And one last thing yeah. for you, Mr. Mojo Ryzen. I get a lot of people asking me about the name. Oh. Okay. So. The name, obviously, well, not obviously, because you'd have to be old enough to know, uh, but Jim Morrison and The Doors did a song called L.A. Woman. Yeah, it's going back to yeah. Harrison. Yeah. yeah, earlier than you. Buddy. Yeah, I believe you. Um, L.A. Woman, and it, it was back in the days of heavy drug use and, oh, and hippies and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and, and Jim Morrison, I'm sure, partook in oh, the, the drug in thing. But anyway, they were doing L.A. Woman, and the drummer, John Densmore, had said to, to Jim Morrison, he said, I want to slow the song right down, and then I want to build it back up, kind of like a, a 
a sexual climax. Okay. So I want to build the song back up. A little rhythm to it. So Morrison went to work. They came into the recording studio the next day. And if you listen to L.A. Woman, it slows right down. And then Morrison starts singing, Mr. Mojo Rising. And, and they pick up, they pick up the, the beat. Really cool. Uh, Densmore said, you know, it, it worked perfectly. It was exactly what he wanted to have happen. And he asked Jim about it after they had recorded, and he said, man, where, where'd you get that from? Like, where did that come from? And Morrison took a piece of paper and wrote out Mr. Mojo Rising, and then he wrote Jim Morrison and started drawing lines between all the letters. Yeah. Mr. Mojo Rising is an anagram for Jim Morrison. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. And... So, so, so why did Bruce put that on his bike? Here, wait, wait, wait. Why did Bruce put that on his bike? <laughs> it's all about creativity. Oh, okay. I, you know what? That kind of artistry, yeah. that kind of creative thought, yeah. that you would connect those things and come up with that, I like to think that maybe there's a little bit of creativity like that in me and, and the things I do. So... Kind of to, to pay homage to my youth and to tie tie that in and, and the too. creativity and everything. And the bike and the, and the fact that up. Karen loved the name Mr. Mojo Rising. She thought it was super cool. Yeah. So I, I think that's uh, definitely going to be the only thing I call you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the only thing you'll call my bike. No, <laughs> I think that's you, <laughs> the build-up man. I love it. Uh, right on. Well. Okay. I think we've touched on everything. Are we good? I think we're good. You, you've got happy. places to go. Yeah, you, I do. You've got you to take your gal out tonight, yeah. and uh, I might take mine out. And wow. I think we had a good session. I think we've um, been great. Like, subscribe. We're on YouTube. We're on podcast platforms. Um, Instagram. Yeah. Instagram. We're on Instagram. We're on Instagram. Uh, at speed. And A N D spelled out color color with a K and no U. Um, yeah, that probably makes that way forget, more complicated. I always forget color with a K. You know. Yeah. Anyway, but. speed and color at speed and color. Uh, that's the way to find us on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, Thanks for. We'll be looking us for you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah great session, it. Harrison. Awesome job, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for having we'll, me. I'm we'll see you again. Be here bugging you yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, we'll, we'll get see it going. You again. Very good. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya. See you later. There you go. It's a cap. Thank you. Isn't isn't that impressive that we can do that in one take? Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't say that.